Please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps us out. And of course, if you have any questions, comment below and we will answer you as soon as we can. Welcome to another video in our series on IGCSE Geography. In today's lesson, we will be doing a case study about earthquakes. In this case, Japan, a developed country, and Bangladesh, a developing country. If you haven't seen our previous videos, click on the card above. Today, on our hazardous earth, we will be looking at earthquakes in Japan and Nepal. Firstly, an earthquake in a developed country. Tohoku, Japan in 2011. On the 11th of March 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake struck 70 kilometers from the coast of Sendai Bay, severely affecting the region of Tohoku and the city of Sendai. The earthquake was the most powerful recorded earthquake in Japan's history and was the costliest natural disaster in history. A huge tsunami followed the earthquake, devastating the east coast of Japan, namely the nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. Japan is a developed country, with a GDP of 4.97 trillion US dollars in 2018. Secondly, an earthquake in a developing country, Nepal in 2015. On the 25th of April 2015, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit Nepal, followed by several severe aftershocks in the months after. The original earthquake's epicenter was around 80 kilometers away from Nepal's capital, Kathmandu. The earthquake originated only 15 kilometers below the surface, meaning it was felt very strongly on the surface. Huge avalanches and landslides were triggered in the Himalayas which runs through Nepal. Damage from the earthquake extended hundreds of kilometers into Pakistan, Tibet, and India. Nepal is a developing country, with a GDP of 29.04 billion US dollars in 2018. Let's look at the impacts of earthquakes in contrasting areas. Firstly, impacts in Japan, a developed country. The primary impacts of the earthquake are as follows. Damage and deaths, around 700 people, from the earthquake itself were low despite the large magnitude of the earthquake. The estimated cost of $235 billion US, made it the costliest natural disaster in history. Around 30 homes and buildings were destroyed and 1,000 were damaged. Two nuclear power stations suffered fractures, causing their shutdown and loss of power. An oil refinery was set on fire due to damaged gas pipes. Roads and railways were badly damaged, including the Tohoku Motonagi. The Fujinuma Dam failed and collapsed after the earthquake, washing away five houses and killing at least four people. Minor liquefaction of the ground caused by shaking, leading to damage of roads and infrastructure. Next, the secondary impacts. A huge tsunami with waves up to 40 meters, 131 feet, high in some places devastated the eastern coast of Japan following the earthquake. 15,900 people died, 2,600 missing, and 6,150 were left injured, mainly due to the tsunami. 450,000 people were left homeless and many more were left without a job after 120,000 buildings were completely destroyed. Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was very badly damaged. The plant suffered nuclear meltdowns and explosions, causing radioactive contamination in the area and a mass evacuation. Four years later people were still not allowed to return to the area surrounding the power plant. Now, let's contrast the impacts in Nepal, a developing country. Firstly, the primary impacts. 9,000 killed and 20,000 injured. 8 million people affected, one-third of Nepal's population. An estimated 3 million people were left homeless after homes were destroyed. 7,000 schools destroyed, and 50% of all shops destroyed, leading to food and supply shortages. Power, water, and communications were severely affected. 1.4 million people were urgently in need of food, water, and shelter. 
the cost of damage was estimated at around $5 billion US. Many historical sites and landmarks were damaged or destroyed. Next, the secondary impacts. Landslides and avalanches triggered by the ground shaking, causing widespread damage to infrastructure, blocking roads, and trapping people under snow and rubble. The avalanches on Mount Everest killed at least 19 people, and avalanches elsewhere left hundreds missing. Landslides blocked rivers. For example, the Kali Gandaki River was blocked by a landslide, and many people had to be evacuated in case of flooding. There was no tsunami as the earthquake started on land. Now, let's contrast the management of earthquakes in contrasting areas. Due to their contrasting levels of wealth and preparedness, Japan and Nepal had different short-term and long-term strategies to respond to the earthquake. Firstly, the short-term relief in Japan. Tsunami warnings were issued by the Japan Meteorological Agency three minutes after the earthquake. Modeling and forecasting technology allowed scientists to predict where the tsunami would hit after the earthquake. Within hours of the tsunami hitting the coast, rescue workers and around 100,000 members of the Japan Self-Defense Force were dispatched to help in the search and rescue operations. Some people were rescued quickly from under rubble with the help of sniffer dogs. However, much of the search and rescue teams focused on recovering bodies washing up on shore following the tsunami. Japan received help from the US military, and international search and rescue teams were sent from New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, China and India. Many areas were covered in debris and mud following the tsunami so were difficult to access in the earlier stages of relief. Hundreds of thousands of people who had lost their homes or were evacuated used temporary shelters set up in schools and other public buildings. A large number of evacuees came from the exclusion zone surrounding the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Many people were quickly put into temporary accommodation or relocated to other areas. After the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown, those who were in the area had their radiation levels checked and health monitored to ensure they did not receive dangerous exposure to radiation. Many evacuees were given iodine tablets to stop radiation poisoning. Next, short-term relief in Nepal. For the first 24 hours after the incident, there was no aid sent to the affected area. The isolated location and poor transport links made it difficult for aid organizations to reach the area quickly. Within a few days, international aid arrived from the UK, India, and China. They brought search and rescue teams, medical support, and essential supplies. Over 87 million pounds in aid was raised by donations. Nepal relied heavily on international aid as the country did not have funds for disaster relief. Half a million tents were provided after the earthquake, many from UNICEF. These tents provided shelter for the homeless and were also used as temporary classrooms and healthcare facilities as the strong aftershocks prevented people from using buildings. With help from international aid, Field hospitals were set up as hospitals were extremely tense were used as emergency shelters after overcrowded with casualties. China sent a 62-person search and rescue team after initial search and rescue efforts in Nepal were slow. Helicopters were used for search, rescue, and supply distribution. Those left stranded by avalanches were rescued by helicopter and communities cut off by severe landslides were given vital supplies. Social media was used as a means of communication for those affected. Facebook introduced a safety check feature after the earthquake which allowed people to mark themselves as safe to family and friends. 300,000 people fled from the capital, Kathmandu, to seek shelter elsewhere, for example with family. Now let's look at the long-term responses to earthquake hazards. Firstly, Japan and planning. There are earthquake drills every year in schools and they are also held in workplaces. Emergency services are specially trained in earthquake response methods. There are now government funding and policies for future earthquake hazards. Next, preparation. Buildings are designed to be earthquake proof. They are built to withstand huge tremors. For example, deep foundations, strong and flexible frames, and the gas immediately shuts off to stop gas leaks and fires. 
Around 87% of buildings in Tokyo are built to be earthquake proof. Larger sea walls have been constructed along the coast in an attempt to block tsunami waves from reaching inland. Earthquake and tsunami warning alerts are sent to every smartphone in Japan and widely broadcast on television. Many people have earthquake survival kits in their homes, containing first aid kits, bottled water, survival tools, and radios. Now let's look at Nepal and planning. In 2015, there was very little earthquake response planning in Nepal despite it being one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world. Programs have been set up on a community level to train people how to respond to earthquakes, as they are usually the first ones on the scene. Next, preparation. Rebuilding is taking place in Nepal, making buildings more resistant to earthquakes whilst also preserving the unique heritage of the area. However, many of the buildings are being rebuilt as one-story homes to make them earthquake-proof, which is not appropriate for larger families. The recovery and preparedness process has had major community involvement, ensuring they are involved with rebuilding, education, and hazard response training. Community-led planning of vegetative barriers to stabilize hill slopes and reduce the risk of landslides has taken place. Lastly for today, prediction. Let's start with Japan. There is currently no sound technology to predict earthquakes, but there is technology in Japan that can predict the areas where an earthquake will hit. Buoys in the ocean detect offshore earthquakes and predict the areas most at risk, sending alerts to those areas that an earthquake is incoming and they should seek immediate cover. Tsunamis can be quickly predicted in Japan using data from the magnitude and location of the earthquake, prioritizing areas for evacuation. Tsunami prediction in Japan is thought to be 80 to 90% accurate at predicting the level of damage in an area. Now, let's look at Nepal. Although earthquakes cannot be predicted, the probability or chance of an earthquake occurring can be calculated using historical data and modeling. A large-scale earthquake was already overdue in Nepal before 2015, but there were no effective strategies to prepare. Landslides and glacial flooding events that are triggered by earthquakes can be modeled and predicted to identify high-risk areas that are likely to suffer in the next event. Nepalese authorities have had issues with implementing building restrictions in these areas, as they are usually ignored. Thank you for watching our video. Please like, subscribe and share. And comment below so we can clarify things for you.